And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this October uh, presentation. Tonight, I'd like to welcome Giles Iyer, who is well known on the London Canal scene as the chair of the Angel Boat, uh, the charity that operates one of our, our community boats, uh, and who has spent the last two or three years, as far as I can remember, studying the history of City Road Basin. So. He's going to give us a presentation tonight telling us all the interesting things that he's found out about it. And you haven't come to listen to me, you've come to listen to him. So I'm going to uh, say welcome, Giles, and hand over to him forthwith. Hello, welcome to this talk about the City Road Basin. As you can see, I'm standing enjoying a sunny afternoon in front of the basin. It's a tale of two centuries of development and redevelopment. Um, as, as introduced, I'm, there, there is our wonderful basin as it was, um, and we can see a little bit more of how this wonderful basin now is or is becoming. Um, I live close to the basin. Um, I've been intrigued by the basin and had some time the last two years to start researching it, and I'm continuing to do so. And because this is an illustrated talk, um, you're going to get the bits that I can illustrate by and large rather than the bits for which there aren't pictures. Uh, this is the Angel Canal boat which is based just by the basin, sitting here in the basin. Uh, I'm a trustee and have been for, for many years of this boat. So what's this story about? Uh, it's going to be about horses, it's going to be about landowners, it's going to be about haystacks, Gentle Giants, Gunpowder, Petrol, good combination, uh, Porcelain, Gin and Tonics, Wallpaper, Drugs, Marble, Electricity, Rocket Bombs, Bibles, and loads and loads of water. So let's see how it goes. Just in case uh, anyone isn't clear, this is the, the basin lying just north of City Road in Islington. It's a large expanse of water. It's some 300 yards long now, surrounded by a mixture of low and very high rise housing, uh, a small park, a few offices, an electrical substation. And it connects with the Regent's Canal on its route from Paddington to Limehouse and the Thames. It's a pleasant area of open space in an area of dense urban housing. There it is on today's map. And we can contrast that with the map of 1890, which shows the basin as it was built some 550 yards long, 35 yards wide, in twice the length it is now and passing under City Road at a bridge. Adjacent to it uh, is Wenlock Basin, uh, part of which still survives. There are clues about the existence uh, of it. Um, it was once a more industrial area, but it's 200 years ago in August 1820 that the City Road Basin was the scene of great celebrations as the Regent's Canal was open throughout its length. There was a grand procession of barges which passed noisily through Islington Tunnel and into the city basin. And of that, there is no illustration. None was made of such an exciting moment. The Regent's Canal um, was a, a very important development. We'll see just why in a moment. Horses, of course, were crucial. Canal transport was the most efficient and reliable form of transport in an age before railways and surfaced roads. Canals were the arteries of the Industrial Revolution in England, without which progress would not have been possible. As it was said at the time by someone, inland waterways are the heart's blood and soul of commerce, obviating the expense and tediousness of land carriage or the more protracted delays invariably attendant on opposite winds and tides. The efficiency of water transport over road transport is extraordinary. A horse can pull two tons in a wagon on a surface road, 30 tons on a narrowboat, 50 tons on a barge on a broad canal. 
it, uh, the efficiency really doesn't have to be stated more than that. It was clearly an attractive form of transport. Initially, transport between London was by sailing ship and by sea. The first canals provided a wind and largely tide free route via Oxford and the Thames. And then in 1794, the Grand Junction Canal connected the Midlands and the North via Braunston in Northamptonshire with the Thames at Brentford, from where bo boats could brave the busy tideway to the city. So just to run through the development immediately round London, the River Thames and the Rivers Lee both were long standing Grand Junction Canal opening in about 1793-94 down to Brentford on the Thames, tidal Thames. The Paddington Arm was then opened in 1801. The Paddington at that time was a small rural village and it was a slow and lengthy 10 mile round trip by horse from the city of London. The Regent's Canal, named after the Prince Regent, who was in fact King George IV by the time it was opened, was built to an unprecedented scale, linking Paddington to the Thames at Limehouse. And it was built on a scale that meant that the locks, as we'll see in a moment, were doubled up to ensure relative, uh, efficient and relatively speedy journeys and to provide a convenient transport link for goods to and from the City of London. Uh, it was an engineering marvel. In fact, we didn't have the City Road Basin. This map shows the canal under construction. Islington Tunnel appears at this point, and after Islington Tunnel, we can see there was a plan for an arm going south to Ask Terrace in Shoreditch. That's, this was to be the connection with the city. But there were difficulties acquiring the land uh, and as a result the decision was taken to look at a, an alternative site at Islington and the city road. The difficulties with the landowner, a Mr Sturt, whose name lives on in the lock nearby, um, were reflecting the difficulties the canal was already having with another man, a barrister, an awkward barrister called William Agar, who lived west of Islington Tunnel, and whose difficulties and litigation with the canal company resulted in a number of rather tight bends that live to this day in the region's canal. And so they gave up on Ask Terrace, and an Act of Parliament was obtained for the city road basin. And this map from about a year after the previous one, in fact, still shows both alternatives. Ask Terrace is there as well as the City Road Basin and the canal shown as yet not fully constructed. So a rural site was found close to the City Road Basin. C city Road, sorry. The City Road had been completed in 1761 and it was the new, a continuation of the new road, which went from Paddington to Islington and on into the city. And a total of 34 and a half acres of land were purchased from the Bishop of London and Dr. Samuel Parr. Uh, sorry, this map shows us a slightly unusual view showing the, the drop from Paddington on the left to Limehouse on the right. Islington Tunnel and the City Road Basin illustrated uh, in it, from this being from 1820. And so here is the basin in the fields in which it was built um, and uh, with no, no further development in the area. Of the 34 and a half acres, not all was required in fact for the canal and nine acres were sold back to the architect John Nash um, who was involved with the Regent's Canal Company, um, perhaps an early example of insider dealing, though exactly what he did with that land is not clear. But the canal was still rural, uh, rural location when opened. And this series of maps illustrate how little development there was in the area. Um, so even as we go into 1830 here, in this map by Denton Rhodes, the area 
immediately north of the canal was still uh, open fields. And in these series of, of, of engravings, which were made just in the 1830s, showing the area just outside the city road basin, above city road locks and to Islington Tunnel, one can see here that there, there were still fields on either side of the canals in this one and also in this shot here with haystacks for those who know the location Knoll Road uh, and open pasture land here. This watercolour shows city road locks, uh, the basin is just behind us below the locks and although the boats wider than seven foot could pass through these locks, the practical size for long distance boats remained seven foot wide narrow boats as shown here in the lock because from Braunston in Northamptonshire north to the rest of the country the gauge was narrow boat width and it was only in the 1930s the locks were widened as far as Birmingham. But the size and the duplication of these locks made this nonetheless the motorway of the canals, all nine miles of the Regent's Canal. And so on the 1st of August, the year after Peterloo, the opening ceremony was carried out and that included the state barge with two military bands on board, processing from what is now Battlebridge Basin near King's Cross through Islington Tunnel and into the city basin, as I say, no picture, unfortunately, of that. A gun salute and large crowds greeted them and they then made their way to Limehouse and the Thames. This was a very significant event with the canal, the artery of commerce being brought with an easy access to the city of London for the first time. As I say, the bank basin was 550 yards long nearly twice the length of what we can see now and by 1824 it, it boasted some seven side docks and it was made to take vessels of various sizes. Here you can see both narrowboats and sailing barges in this picture by De Wint. Uh, and and Shepherd's picture again shows us uh, a, a number of different type of craft present in the in the basin. It was only three miles then from this major transport hub and transshipment centre to the commercial heart of the British Empire. But the City Road Basin was connected with the industrial heart of Britain and through London it was connected with the world and it offered high speed transport as it then was by non-stop what were called flyboats to the rest of the country. Birmingham was under three days away in a non-stop boat. This was fast, reliable travel. And the importance of this route is reflected in the tonnage of goods which were then carried on the canal in its early years. In 1821, the first full year, 195,000 tons. In 1829, 495,000 tons. And in 1834, 625,000 tons. These pictures by Shepherd are interesting uh, for a particular reason. The boat, as we enlarge it, we can see is a Pickford's boat tied up in the basin. He also, as well as this engraving, did a watercolour. And in the watercolour, very similar scene, a boat, this is Snell Price, Price. Pickford's at wharf one and three, Snell and Bryce at wharf number seven. Um, an early example perhaps of product placement. Also in the background we see there the entrance to the gauging dock about which I will talk a bit further in a moment. This uh, survey by the Regents Canal Company relatively recently discovered um, shows the basin with its various side arms although two, the one which was the gauging dock and one which is top right, which you may not be able to see, depending where you put, put the picture, which I think you're stuck with of me, uh, is where the Pickford's Wharf is, which we shall talk about. These slightly strange picture, this one showing the basin looking back towards Islington, so from City Road looking north. Perspective is unusual. Looks like uh, a gunpowder plot uh, was being put together by the men who are in the picture. 
but it gives some idea of the activity that there was in the basin. And here, again, from City Road, although the perspective is strange and the horse is stranger, uh, gives another idea of the sort of uh, buildings and wharves that were present. 14 canal carriers moved in, uh, many from out of town bases at Paddington, some short haul, some long distance. And in 1833, the occupants were the ones we can see here. I've highlighted in yellow the long distance carriers, but on the right, you can see the large variety of different businesses. Obviously, carriers, the main business at this stage still, but a wide variety of different businesses that had moved in. The growth of London and the growth of Islington following the opening of the canal is phenomenal. The population of Islington grew from 1820 to the 1870s by a factor of 10, by a factor of 15 by 1900. And housing, trading behind of course, doubled in 10 years, uh, was, grew by eightfold by the 1870s and tenfold by 1900. Goods were brought in by barge from the London docks and from ports around the Thames estuary and by wagon from manufacturers and dealers around the city and transported to Birmingham, Leicester, Nottingham, Chesterfield, Manchester, Liverpool, and many other places between and in addition. And then finished consumer goods, goods for export, were brought back to the city road basin for onward transmission either to the city or to the docks. One of the largest carriers was Pickford's, the gentle giant of later years, a removal company as it then was, and it offered timed tabled services throughout England by non-stop horse-drawn services. And we can see in the Shepherd uh, painting, uh, the two Pickford boats sitting in City Road lock. The Pickford's Basin, uh, Pickford's Wharf was at the far end, the other side, as I would call it, from the City Road, an area which is now entirely filled in and has the privilege of being the base for an um, enormous high-rise building and a lot of housing. Pickford's offered non-stop timetabled services throughout England uh, by narrow boat and until the arrival of the railways from the late 1830s uh, the two and a half mile an hour of a horse-drawn boat traveling non-stop was as, in practice, practice as fast as you could transport goods and it remained an attractive and competitive means of transporting some goods into the 20th century. This flyer of Pickford's um, is worth uh, a quick look at whilst describing in the top third the services offered in the bottom two thirds sets out the terms and conditions applicable to such travel. Pickford's demanded the building of a gauging dock in the basin, and this was opened in 1821. The gauging dock was essential for the efficient use of their boats. Tolls were charged on the basis of tonnage. Tonnage was me measured by measuring the freeboard of the boat, how far, how high above the water it was floating, uh, Archimedes principle, and the boat had to be gauged by putting weights in it in order to see uh, how far it would go down into the water with different loads upon it. The, gauge, the gauging dock was on the corner of the basin and just short of the lock, and there is this one uh, drawing by Shepherd of the inside of it, of a boat, a narrow boat being gauged with weights being lowered into it so that a record could be kept of the amount of displacement that different loads would result in. Uh, this from a different period uh, is a gentleman who is gauging a barge in the way that they would have been gauged throughout, measuring the freeboard at various points on the boat and thereby calculating the load on the boat. No pictures of the wharf exist, um, but the wharf was described in 1842 
This large establishment nearly surrounds the southern extremity of the City Road Basin. A gate opens into an area where we cannot remain many minutes without witnessing a scene of astonishing activity. From about five or six in the evening, wagons are pouring in from various parts of town, laden with goods intended to be sent into the country by canal. In the morning, on the other hand, laden wagons are leaving the establishment, conveying to different parts of the metropolis goods which have arrived by canal during the night. On the eastern side is stabling. In the centre is the general warehouse, an enormous roofed building with open sides. On the left are ranges of offices and counting houses. There's nothing more astonishing than to see upwards of a hundred clerks engaged in managing the business of the establishment. On the screen is a, a docket for Mr Musgrove's consignment. He was sending four bales in the trunk weighing just under half a tonne by boat from City Road Basin. At some cost, as we can see as we translate that uh, into 2019 values. And it wasn't just goods that were being transported by Pickfords. We know that in 1822, 800 soldiers were transported in 26 boats from City Row Basin to Liverpool. And there was a contract uh, to do that with other consignments of soldiers, presumably on their way to Ireland. And in this picture, which we saw earlier, the position of the Pickford's uh, wharf is through the bridge and the far end of the basin. In 1841, census was carried out and there was a record made of the bargeman at Pickford's Wharf. Slightly difficult to read in its original form. I have transposed it and we can see a list of 21 boats, not all the names I'm afraid, fortunately legible, and their crews who were on board. A total of 80 males, six females, and three under 12, or 12 or under uh, who were there. No other boats are recorded on the basin, although in fact other boats with people on board must have been there uh, given the number of carriers around. Pickford's remained um, in, in, in the canal business only until 1847 when it transferred its loyalties to rail and road. It remained on the same site uh, and in the early 1900s began filling it in in order to make more room for a car park for lorries and vans. But their business and that of other long distance carriers transferred to the Grand Junction Canal Company's carrying department, which was based at Wharf 30. What was being carried and where was it being carried to? Well, not much information is available for this early period, but a train of five narrowboats pulled by a steamer was involved in an explosion at Macclesfield Bridge, which is in the picture here, in Regent's Park on the 2nd of October, 1854. They had loaded at City Road Basin overnight and they set off at two in the morning. And the narrowboat Tilbury blew up, killing all three crew. Windows were shattered for half a mile around. The report into the explosion carried out by Major Magendi, Her Majesty's Inspector of Gunpowder Works, contains details of the goods being transported that night from the city road, road basin around the country. And a summary of the main destinations and the main cargoes is, is set out on the screen. And we can see the wide variety of goods being transported. Tea, coffee, sugar, pickles, cheese, ginger, candles, headstones, bacon, butter, cement, wine, sardines, nuts, jams, petroleum spirit, and of course the gunpowder that caused the explosion when the, when the uh, fumes from petroleum spirit were ignited by either the open lamp or the stove on the boat. So this wide range of cargoes was being carried on fast narrowboats from the City Road Basin, even at a time when the railways had become well established, 1874, in competition with the canals. And this pattern of mixed consignments of goods being transported on flyboats continued until World War II. The Grand Junction Canal, Carrying Company, Canal Company's carrying department was based at Wharf 30, which we can see on this plan. Again, a lack of illustrations, sadly, of um, the 
th that wharf or their boats. Um, but they developed their own boatyard adjacent to the basin on the corner of Wenlock Basin, just outside the City Road Basin, and in 1859 ordered their first steam narrowboat, uh, which was delivered in, in uh, 1860. Uh, this is a suggested uh, appearance of what it may have looked like from an article that was written about it um, just at that time. And we can see in this sense of 1861 that that boat Pioneer was overnight in the basin on the date in April 1861, along with 12 other boats. And again, uh, mainly men on board those boats, 47 men and three women on the 13 boats that were in the basin that, that night. In October 1876, the Grand Junction Canal Carrying Company went bust, um, largely as a result of the Macclesfield Bridge explosion and the claims that arose from it. And we have a catalogue of the sales that took place. And one of the sales took place at Wenlock Basin and a large variety of craft and goods uh, were sold. It's worth looking at them, I think, if nothing else, for their names. The Steam Tug Spanker, the team Steam Tug Havoc, um, and then the hull of another Steam Tug Rattler, and also a Pincher. A Hire Fleet could not think of a better set of names uh, today, I do not think. Um, but we can see the large number of vessels that there were still at that point uh, down in Wenlock Basin, which therefore would have been serving City Road Basin. The total of 14 horse boats, three steamboats, nine working steam tugs, five hulls of st steam tugs, a pumping and fire engine, a gunpowder boat, three barges, a floating wet block, and everything down to various wrenches and spanners, all for sale. In due course, the business that had been there went came into the hands of fellows Morton and Clayton still at Wharf 30 and they continued to, to carry goods from that base on the wharf on the basin until nationalization in 1948. Now, this is the um, entrance to the wharf and a couple of their boats tied up just outside the tunnel just outside the basin. In 1911 um, a marketing effort was made by the Regents Canal and Dock Company uh, and a fine advert appeared for Fellows Morton and Clayton with one of their steamers uh, and reference to the wharfs at 30 Wharf Road. In 1911, the last census, there were a number of their boats present uh, in the basin a uh, total of eight boats, of which three were steamers, so five were simply horse boats, and a total of 24 adult male boatmen. This is the return for the steamer Colonel, and we can see it with its crew of four, captain, mate, driver, and assistant driver, the usual crew for a steamer working non-stop, two of them on at any one time. What do we know about the boat people? Not a lot. Soon after their arrival on the Regents Canal in 1820, there was some concern expressed about their moral well-being. In April 27, 1827, a boatman and riverman's Bethel Union Chapel was opened by an organisation called the North London Auxiliary Seamen's and Soldiers' Friends Society, which was led by the indomitable G.C. Boson Smith, a Baptist minister. And this chapel was in Cottage Lane, just off City Road, just up from the City Road Basin. Cottage Lane no longer exists, although the line of the road can still be identified by the alignment of fencing along a play area that is there. But this was only a temporary arrangement, as by June 1828, there was sufficient interest for a new chapel. And by the end of 1828, a new chapel had been built in Macclesfield Street South. And you can see its position in both the 1890s map and today. Um, 
and this was declared to be the first chapel that has ever been built in the kingdom expressly for boatmen and their families without standing connected with any one religious denomination. In the 1890s map, you can see it's in fact marked as a Sunday school, and it ceased to have appears to have ceased to operate as a boatman's chapel by then. The services at the chapel were announced in some style. A mast is rigged out over the chapel, and a Bethel flag was displayed this day with very good effect, as it was distinctly seen from the bridge in the city road. The following year, it was recorded that many boatmen and their families had been induced to attend here from the Regent's Canal Basin, and the Bethel flag flies every Sabbath on a mast at the head of the chapel, visible to all the Paddington coaches. Uh, the Paddington coaches being the predecessor, of course, as you all know, of the 205 bus, which still runs the same route, but without Bethel flags waving. The Bethel flag was at that time commonly used by those preaching to sailors to call them to religious meetings on ships and other places. And in 18, March 1830, it was reported that many evenings, 40 or 50 of these men from the boats and wharves, some having their wives and children with them, attended. And on one occasion during the late severe frost, 100 were present at the chapel. It's slightly less clear whether that was a result of there being more boats in the basin stuck by the frost or the fact that they had heating in the chapel. And Mr Richardson was engaged to enter upon the laborious duties of a canal boatman's missionary. A Sunday school was opened and that presumably is the reference uh, which was the sort of survived the boatman's chapel and is a reference on the map we can see. The last reference though, to the chapel itself is in 1843 although the school took over and there are various references to that and the site was eventually redeveloped in the 1970s and all possible signs of it obliterated. But in 1877, so another 35 years on, there was still sufficient boatmen on the, on the Regent's Canal that the London City Mission, which had been formed by the um, GC Boson Smith in 1824, appointed a missionary for boat people on the canals of London. And in 1895, this was Edward Blanchard, Blanchard, who you can see here with his wife. He made regular visits to the City Road Basin as detailed in his two surviving diaries for 1903 and 1917 um, on Wednesdays. In 1903, there were sailing barges, the sailing barges in the basin outnumbered what he called monkey boats, that's narrow boats with up to 11 sailing barges and up to nine monkey boats being found. But in 1917, the situation had changed with many fewer sailing barges found between none and four and more narrow boats up to 12. Two illustrations of preaching taking place are, are shown here. Um, not clear exactly their location, whether this one was City Row Basin or whether this is in Paddington Basin. An increasing number of different businesses occupied the wharves around the basin. Some provided domestic supplies such as coal and others supplied the house building market with timber and stone as with this extensive timber yard which is on the corner of the basin and the region's canal with its fine stacks of timber. I'm not clear how you either put the top bit on or took it off, let alone how you did it safely, but they are undoubtedly impressive stacks of timber. But there were also more specialist businesses which set up around the basin, such as Davenport's, a large pottery business based in Longport, now Stoke-on-Trent, which operated out of a substantial warehouse during much of the 19th century at Wharf 28. Its location is shown on the left, I hope it's left for you, 1890s map and on the right the present uh, position of the warehouses. They were a fine set of a, a, a threesome of, of buildings 
and these internal views, which we're thankful to Malcolm Tucker, thank you Malcolm, um, show it with a trap door which opened, gave access down to the canal below to enable loading, loading or unloading to take place uh, out away from the elements. Sadly, demolished in the 1970s. This uh, fence comes from the anti-dry rot company who had wharf number four, uh, where they constructed tanks and immersed wood in a mercurial salt to preserve it. And a wooden picket fence is suppo supposed to be still standing in Regent's Park, a uh, product of that process. The investment is from 1835. Although there are no illustrations, I thought I'd just mention the salt merchants who also had their bases within the basin um, at both wharfs 27 and 29. Um, the Droitwich Salt Company was present soon after the basin opened uh, and its salt almost certainly being transported by a narrow boat and in, subsequently seems to have been replaced by Western and Westall the salt merchants, merchant, uh, which brought in salt from um, uh, Worcestershire and from Cheshire and took a back cargo, which is always the problem trying to find a return load, a back cargo to the North Staffordshire of Flintstones. And those Flintstones had come from the beaches at Gravesend and New Haven by barge uh, to the City Road Basin. Towards the end of that business in the 1890s, the salt was being transported by sea to the docks and then transported from the docks to their warehouses in the City Road Basin from where they were distributed around London. Uh, an interesting change in business. Actually, I didn't want to show you that picture yet. I'm going to go back for a moment just to stay with the anti-dry rot, if we may. Um, there were a number of unpleasant processes going on in the area. In 1853, the Illustrated Magazine of Art wrote, City Road is crossed by the Regent's Canal, and all along both sides of the canal and around the basin are various large wharves and manufacturing establishments. The pedestrian finds himself in a neighbourhood, the char characteristics of which differ almost as much from the ordinary city streets as does a backward settlement from a village highway. In the place of houses and shops and well-dressed people, he's suddenly in the midst of coke, lime, slate and stucco works, and he sees few other passers-by than workmen in their ordinary workaday clothes, sometimes very much whitened and soiled with dust. The whole area was being turned into an industrial estate. But in amongst those wharves and this uh, grime and dirt, Bass the Brewer had a base. And perhaps more interestingly at this spot shown on the maps was W. Pitt and Co at 28 Wharf. The first carbonated tonic water was developed by W. Pitt and Co initially as a medicinal product to combat malaria in the colonies. And it was advertised with testimonials in the Lancet. But the virtually undrinkable bitter quinine was found remarkably drinkable once gin was added. And the idea was pursued very successfully by a competitor, Schweppes, in the 1870s, although Pitt did continue up until World War I at their base on City Road base. Carlisle and Clegg were paper stainers or wallpaper makers. And they were present at Wharf 16 from the 1860s. This aerial photograph from just after World War II shows that the roofs of buildings no longer used by them still contained their names, although quite why they had their names on a roof in the day before people were flying, I'm not sure. But Carlisle and Clegg were there and they expanded their business. Um, they also produced wallpapers of all colours. Their green uh, wallpaper was one of those found in 1876, resulting in arsenic poisoning. And in due course, uh, they had to find a different source 
for the green dyes. Also present in the basin, the London Galvanised Iron Company, 27 Wharf Road, present for a long period up to World War I, and Bumstead and Co with their various products, including soda crystals, uh, which was also present. At this point, shown on the map just after, on the photo just after World War II, the slightly strange shaped business uh, was the rubbish dump. This was the St Luke's Vestry, later Finsbury Borough Council site, their wharf which handled refuse. Um, although it looks pretty uninspired there, there was an inspired plan to replace it in the 1880s with what I think is the most wonderful Victorian building. Uh, all this for disposing of rubbish. The tragedy is uh, that they remain plans and it was never built. In 1893, the Hydraulic Power Company built large premises at 34 Wolf Road to produce pressurised water, which was piped around London to operate machinery as varied as Tower Bridge and theatre safety curtains. Its magnificent building, subsequently used by a furniture manufacturer, was demolished in the 1970s, uh, when it was about to be listed to preserve it. The company was purchased nonetheless by Mercury Communications to run optic fibre cables through the old pipework which had taken the pressurised water. And I understand the idea failed because of the tight bends which worked for water but not for glass fibre cables. And immediately next door to the power company and you can see it just on the left of the picture was the offices of International Harvester for many years. This picture is interesting because it shows the southern end of what is now the basin entire, which, and has been entirely filled in and it shows the remnants of the bridge over City Road although at that time the other side of the bridge has been filled in, a coffer down place there and it has become a car park. Less Clean energy uh, was produced at the County of London Electric Lighting Company's generating station. And this wonderful building is seen here from City Road. City Road Bridge is just off to the right of this picture. And you can see the location on that map there. And the current view there. Again, City Road the Basin is just to the right of that tall skyscraper and the bridge, which you can still feel as you cycle over, is just to the right of the picture. If we go back to this pic the original picture, the water trough appears in the corner there at the junction um, with Macclesfield Street. And if we look at today's picture, I'm glad to say, though it's slightly moved, the drinking fountain and for the horses remains, uh, although somebody has added a public lavatory and enough street furniture, I think, to keep us all busy for several days. And that is the site which was by then uh, electrical offices uh, in times of dereliction in the 1970s. So that's looking back to where the generating company was. Starting in 1909, most of the Graham Street side of the basin and subsequently parts of the Wharf Road side became the premises of a pharmaceutical company, British Drug Houses, and where it developed a number of drugs, including anaesthetics, insulin, and penicillin. This slightly unrealistic picture shows the full extent of their building at the height, the basin running down there, and the canal running along there. This plan again shows you as it was um, at its heyday, with a large part of the basin under its ownership and a bridge linking the two halves of the business on the two sides of the basin. 
that linking bridge was originally a um, rope, a, a, a chain bridge, which you can just see here in this clip from, still from a, a film. Um, interestingly, I think, um, tolls had to be paid for the tonnage transferred across the ropeway. The, the tolls being charged by the canal company, which remained the owner of the basin. And indeed, the basin still remains in the ownership of the Canal and River Trust. Only the City Road Basin and Limehouse Basin were owned by the canal company throughout the history of the canal. The bridge became a solid bridge, as we can see in this picture here in due course, linking the two halves. But by the 1970s, BDH was then part of Glaxo, and the site was being abandoned. And by this stage, much of the basin was becoming derelict. Dyspecker is the site which is just outside the basin, beside the city road locks. On this picture, the basin stretches off down to the right. Uh, this uh, th this picture is a promotional picture which Dyes Pecker produced. It was founded by an Italian entrepreneur, Luigi Odorico, in Hamburg. And following a visit to England by his sales rep, uh, Mr. Dyes Pecker, in 1926, they set up on what was previously a timber yard. Um, the factory to produce terrazzo and mosaic and we can see the position on that map just above the locks this is the present view of the site from outside in the road building itself and now owned by architects who Paula thomas edwards who somewhat amusingly used that original picture as their moving in card An, an advertisement from Dyes Pecker and interestingly a picture from within the premises which we've just been looking at where they are creating um, either terrazzo or possibly polishing up some marbles and um, I think the most noteworthy item in there is the gentleman's hat in the centre of the picture. This was the water side of the Dyes Pecker wharf taken from just uh, to the, the tunnel side of the locks with one of the uh, canal company's <coughs> tugs and, and barges tied up on the wharf. Um, as the uh, Canal River Trust still have rights of mooring and passage across the wharf, I assume uh, that was the case in the 1950s as well. And this again, a current view uh, with the Angel to of Islington to international canal boat tied up outside. One of the last businesses to make any use of water transport was the timber and wall board business of Andersons at Harris Wharf uh, and subsequently City Wharf, which is now all lost beneath housing called Crystal Wharf and was the site of the gauging dock, which we saw earlier on in the course of this talk. Imports via the Port of London were carried by barge to the warehouse, although fairly early on they found that it was more economical to do it by road because their items were not, were, uh, were not heavy and the, uh, the carriers considered it not economic to carry them. This plaque from Harris Wharf still exists at Crystal Wharf. You can see the nature of the boards they were producing, including the rather homely Aspestalux. Um, a picture here from the towpath looking back at the Anderson's yard. The lock is to the right, the basin is down to the left. And this is possibly a photograph showing one of the last commercial crafts unloading at Anderson's and probably one of the last craft to unload in the basin uh, in all time because the businesses left were not using water transport. If we take the view from City Road Locks, this is wonderful picture from 1905, which we saw earlier when we were looking at the timber yard, and on the left, the double decker stables that there were on the towpath. 
behind it a school which has now moved that's Hanover School as it was before it was replaced by a new building a little further down the canal. The current view is that is now a care home, a school has moved and the double decker stables long gone. Swiveling slightly round, one can see from the 1960s, large parts of the British drug houses premises and on the very right, Anderson's uh, and their timber yard. The basin had a war, as they say, um, in, on the 23rd of November 1944, a V2 hit the basin. And we can see from this drawing made up the following day at the point of impact right beside Anderson's yard and where the worst fire occurred on the other side part of the British Drug Houses building, although it wasn't the only burned building that was damaged. This records the fact that there was no crater because the rocket bomb hit the water and there was a serious fire in which one person was killed and I think something like 80 odd people were injured. So that's a bit of a V2 bomb. This was the state of things once the fires were a fire was extinguished. Uh, this is the British Drug House building. This is the other side of the canal, Anderson's and the remainder of the British Drug House building, which doesn't look too healthy, but it didn't burn out. Anderson's was obviously fairly seriously damaged, as were some of the boats lying in front of it. And this is from the looking across the locks. Uh, at Hanover School, uh, obviously fairly damaged, and the double-decker stables one can see just at the right of the photograph, uh, which appear to have taken quite a hit as well. Interestingly, for those uh, who like these things, if you read the book Idle Women by Susan Wolfitt, you'll find a description of being tied up just below the lock in the basin when the bomb hit. Um, it's an account by one of the women who worked on canal boats during the war and had just happened to be there and narrowly avoided death. There were plans to rebuild the stable block, these plans from 1949, but nothing seems to have come of that. As dereliction took over, interest in the Regent's Canal developed in some quarters. The Inland Waterways Authority, um, Association ran several trips along its length, as here, where the narrowboat Cairo and Warwick, uh, crewed by George and Sonia Smith, later Sonia Rolt, uh, took a, a few passengers um, along the length of the Regent's Canal. And they all looked very comfy in the uh, facilities that were provided for them. And this picture from 1966 gives some idea of the sort of state that the basin had reached. Not much was happening in the basin by 1966. On the right, just vis visible in the right foreground is the um, pumping house from the London Hydraulic Power Company. Beyond it is the site where Fellows Morton and Clayton had been until the 1940, about 1948, uh, and beyond that, the warehouses of Davenport's on the right. On the left was the power generating station, then the electrical offices, and further down, British drug houses. And at the far end, Hanover School and back into Islington with St Mary's visible in the distance. Local resident Crystal Hale set up a boat club for young people living locally in about 1970. And this picture is interesting. It's looking down the basin to the south, City Road Basin, sorry, City Road, and the bridge is just about where that circle is. But the circle is there to show you the line of old industrial buildings, the further side, the southern side of City Road so that the line of the basin could still be seen at that stage, although there was no water there. 
a barge, um, Water Gypsy was brought in as a clubhouse. This was a bit of interest being shown by one of the television companies at that stage in this uh, project of a boat club. And Water Gypsy was brought in as a clubhouse, sailing boats were obtained, and the Islington Boat Club was founded. But plans were afoot to fill in a large part of the now derelict basin and a campaign led by Crystal Hale and other like-minded people who recognised the potential of the basin as water space was fought. And you can see Save This Basin, uh, Save the Basin scrawled on the wall of the British Drug Houses building uh, below the lock here. The first canal festival to highlight the potential plight of the basin was held in 1973 by the Inland Waterways Association and this was a plaque which was offered to all boaters who turned up at it. Uh, these are two photographs that we have of that rally that took place in 1973, bringing the attention of a lot of people for the first time to the canal and its potential if kept. In the end, only another 13% of the basin was lost near the city road. And now in its own clubhouse, uh, the Boat Islington Boat Club continues to provide the same water-based activities for local young people. And you can just see there um, part of the name of Water Gypsy, which is still tied up outside at the barge, which is still used as part of their facilities. Crystal Hale also set up a community canal boat to provide the experience of canal trips for local young people, the Angel of Islington. Uh, this shows it with slightly more than 12 passengers on board, but I don't know what the rules were in those days, 1974. And the boat is just outside Dyspecker Wharf, just above the locks. And this organisation, my organisation, continues to provide day and residential trips for local people, young and old, in the successor boat, Angel 2 of Islington. And once a year in September, the basin becomes spectacularly alive with the Angel Canal Festival, a waterways and community event. Originally a celebration of the return of the Angel community boat from its half year of travels around the waterways with young people, uh, and now a community event, but sadly um, this year for the first time cancelled uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Next time you visit the area and you see this expanse of water and modern buildings, keep in mind the important contribution it made to our economy, important commercial hub for its first 140 years. Thank you. Are you there, Martin? Hello, yes, I'm about to uh resume video there we go thank you giles that was a tour de force uh and uh evidence of your expertise as a researcher in large measure because you uncovered a vast number of uh, drawings and pictures that i had certainly never seen and that uh, have probably not seen the light of day for a considerable long long time until you unearthed them anyway uh let us, if you don't mind, ask the audience if they would like to ask you any questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A. You can also use the chat if for some reason you can't use the Q&A. Um, but the, uh, the Q&A is open for the audience to ask questions, failing that, the chat. So audience, please ask anything you'd like Giles to answer. Unless I've said you all to sleep or just filled you with so much information. Um, aha. There we are, the first question has appeared. I, I have to, oh, it's not actually a question, it's a, a compliment. Um, anyone got a question that would, uh, they would like answered about the uh, basin? It's unusual not to have any any questions, maybe because you've answered them all. <laughs> uh, something has arisen in the chat. Here we are. 
Um, Debbie asks you, uh, Giles, what is the quirkiest thing that fascinates you about the, the basin? What is the quirkiest thing that fascinates Giles the most regarding the basin? A terrible question. Um, <laughs> uh, just because I don't it's a think it's a question. quirky place. I think it's a very serious place. Um, I think perhaps the most exciting thing I discovered, which was slightly quirky, I suppose, were the... Um, Complaints that were made about the nude bathing in the 1830s taking place under the bridge just by the basin. Um, the gen gentlemen only nude bathing uh, and, and complaints arose about that and the necessary involvement of uh, the constabulary to deal with it. But I, don't know, I think that's about the best I can do for you, I'm afraid. Sorry, Debbie. OK, well, thank you for that, Giles. That was quite quirky, but actually, I think uh, bathing uh, without costumes was quite common along canals in general in the 19th century. The, the Victorians weren't quite as prudish as we think they might be. Well, I, I, certainly the missionaries were upset, I, I gather from the <laughs> correspondence. Well, I, I seem to remember that in Battlebridge Basin, when I first started uh, uh, at the museum in the late 1990s, um, on Sunday afternoons, the pub that was there was, was sometimes used for dares. And I need to say very little more about that. Um, so anyway, back to questions. Uh, Sue would like to ask you, has using the basin for moorings ever been considered? Yes and no, is the answer. Um, it has been, cons it has an unusual status because though it's owned by um, the Canal Authority, British Waterways now CRT, um, it has been leased to Islington Council for really all the time since it's been saved and Islington Council has, has leased it in order to provide the facilities for the boat club and it was felt for a whole variety of reasons that mooring were inconsistent with the safety of the operation of the boat club. There has more recently some talk about installing residential moorings at the further end of it um, although that raised difficulties again, I think, for the operation of the boat club safely. Um, but that was being looked at for reasons of obviously financing and financing the boat club. Uh, but essentially, no, it is being maintained as an open space, the mooring being limited to the boat club. And in fact, uh, the, the Angel of Islington also, uh, the community boat also has a right to moor there, although at the moment it's difficult to find a, a convenient and safe spot for it. Indeed, there's not much water in there, to tell you the truth. Um, if you go up past, even try and get past where the boat club is based, you become seriously stemmed up. Um, and then in the summer, of course, you get seriously weeded up. So there's a dredging operation to be done in any event. So no, no plans for mooring, um, only really during the canal festival is there some mooring around in the base. Okay, we've got several more questions have, have popped up now. Uh, the next one is from Roger, and he asks, uh, every time I've been passed, I haven't seen it in use. What should or could be done to increase usage? I, yes, I, I'm not aware of the boat club and its activities. Um, I don't know exactly its rotor. I think you have to go on to have a look. There are times when it is busy. Um, there are times when it's not. It's obviously busier during school holidays, COVID permitting, uh, than it is during term time. And there are uh, slots in late afternoon and evening as well. So it depends on the nature of the activity. It also depends on the nature of the funding that's available at any one time to enable different groups to come and use it at the, at the boat club. Um, it is not uh, always full of boats. And that's for sure. It's not always full of dinghies, sailing boats or, or canoes. Um, maybe that's one of its features that it is an expanse of water that is not line to line with uh, residential boats. Okay, thank you, Giles. Uh, Henry asks, uh, what formal protection exists for the basin now? Formally, um, none, I think is the answer. I don't think it's got any formal protection. Um, I mean, planning battles have been fought and they've all pretty much been fought now over it. Um, but I don't believe it has any formal protection. You know, it's, it's status, it's part of, the, of, of it's CRT land or CRT water. Um, it's leased to the council and that, that's, the, the council has so far had a commitment to preserving it pretty much as it is. Okay, and the last one 
uh, is from Chris, who asks, where were the main offices of Thomas Clayton and Pickford's? Pickford's, if you look at, if we're looking at the current picture, Pickford's were out of sight. Um, the very tallest of the tall buildings is built more or less where Pickford's were down the far end. So if we um, returned, can we return to it? I don't know, why won't it go back? Try it. Oh, no, it's going to go shooting onto the next one. It's through the bridge, it's Pickford's. Um, and as far as, um, as far as Morton and Clayton were concerned, they were about there, in that sort of area. So what is almost approaching the end of the water space as it now is, with a sidearm going off up there. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. Sidearm going up in that direction. Um, so those were the two main carrier bases. Okay. Uh, now, Alison asks, are you anticipating any further developments around the basin over the coming years? And she also says uh, to thank you uh, for an excellent presentation with fantastic images and information. But the question was, what further developments are you expecting over the next few years? It is pretty much um, developed out, except um, there is some, has been question about the boat club itself developing or redeveloping um, which I think the last I heard was back to something less um, less extreme than that. There have been plans which have been raised which involved exchanging bits of the gardens that we can see here this area which was part of the drug house factory um, for sort of housing and things but that doesn't seem to be going anywhere and there are a small area down down this bottom end there is the electrical substation a hideous building hums away quietly at night and there are little bits around that but i think they're all pretty much locked up with the security requirements of that electrical station so um at the moment it looks like it's pretty well developed out and this stuff at the bottom here now is is um well there's still a crane there but the basic stuff on the on the root of the basin is now complete so um i think i think for better or for worse and you can make your own mind up about that one. Um, we're pretty much there until someone gets very radical and starts not knocking this lot down. Okay, well, there's one more comment, uh, 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 a comment, uh, excellent talk, superbly researched and illustrated from Chris. Uh, any more questions going, going, gone? If anyone would like to ask a last question, there's probably enough time for one more. I do, if, you, if you actually have any further queries or any contributions, do email me and I'm sure you can. If no other way, you can do so through through Martin, but you'll, you'll yes. find me around. Indeed. Well, okay. Well, in that case, uh, Giles, thank you very much indeed for a superb presentation. We've had a number of uh, comments from the audience uh, praising your research and delivery, and I certainly endorse those. Uh, it was uh, quite a tour de force, as I said earlier, and uh, you've obviously done a great deal of painstaking research and found an awful lot of material that uh, uh, hadn't previously been unearthed by any of the historians of the Regents Canal. So well done for all that uh, hard work that you must have done over the last couple of years. And I'm sure that meant many years, uh, many, uh, many days spent in dusty archives and uh, searching through <laughs> files and things. Including yours, Martin. <laughs> including uh, including the, those of the London Canal Museum, but uh, we, we didn't contribute the majority of the material, only a few photographs from our collection. So thank you very much Giles. Uh, it's sometimes possible for people to wave their hands uh, on, in Zoom. Um, I'm not sure if we've enabled that. Ah yes we have. So if the audience would like to wave instead of clap they are very welcome to do that. Uh, but Giles thank you very much indeed for a, a most informative and excellent talk. Well thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.
Audience, thank you very much for your attendance. The next talk will be uh, on the 5th of November, uh, Gunpowder Fireworks Day. Uh, it will be George Rogers on the Erewash Canal. And uh, he is uh, a, a change of speech, uh, speaker, but not a change of topic. So that will be on the website soon. Look at canalmuseum.org.uk slash what's on, and you'll soon find the link to register for that Zoom talk. Thank you all for taking part. Good night. <laughs>